Okay, so yeah, so the whole point of today is just um, an opportunity to chat to you and learn a bit more about your experience forming the union. Um, it's a bit background, so I guess like from the yoga teacher's perspective, um, we've never been unionized. Um, there's one union that was beginning to be formed in New York last year, um, and that's since fallen through. Um, so yeah, we're kind of like the first of its kind in the world. Um, and there's a lot of kind of uncertainty about how we'll do that. And, you know, we've had huge amounts of support and encouragement and engagement so far. Um, but I thought it'd be really, really helpful to chat to you for a bit and record it because obviously you were one of the first people that Jamie from the IWGB put me in touch with because uh, he said that we have a lot of similarities. So I thought it'd be really helpful for fellow yoga teachers to hear a bit about your process and your experience. Um, so we'll start with the first question, if that's OK, yep. um, which is simply, could you share a little bit of your background on who you are and what you do? Yep. Uh, uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Declan Peach and I am the vice chair, the national vice chair of the Game Workers branch of the IWGB. And I'm also one of its founding members and was um, at one point the sole organizer for the branch. Um, what were the main challenges that you face in the gaming industry and why did you feel it was right to start a union? Um, as an industry and as a whole, the, the, there are several really big problems we have uh, and still do have. Um, num well, it's hard to number them in order of importance, but like the number one on top of my head is crunch, which is the term for where... Uh, projects in game development often have this issue where at the near the end of a project everyone will be put under a lot of pressure to get the project finished in time for a release date and that will often lead to being put under pressure mainly via social pressure but also via like straight up illegal threats by employers uh, to work overtime which is usually unpaid um, Beyond that, the industry also just has a huge problem with like representation of marginalized groups and discrimination. Like, I think it's only I think only so an uh, example forty eight percent ish of people who play games are women, uh, but only seven percent. Uh, last time I checked, uh, it's not. I don't quote me. Don't use me as a direct source for that. But it's only, it's around only like less than ten percent of developers are women um, and it leads to uh, many many issues with um, work like the workplace experiences and like the career prospects for people who are like women as well as like people of color and whatnot uh, and yeah these are yeah those are the two main massive ones uh, and the other main thing we what was wrong with the industry is despite all of those things not many many people really understood what a union was or what one could do for them um and so the prospect of organizing was very um not a thing <laughs> nobody really knew what to do to uh take matters into their own hands and how how receptive were people when you started to kind of introduce this to them as a, as an option as an opportunity um, at the very beginning, very, very receptive. <laughs> um, from in my experience, when we first started, it was it it was very much a case of everyone was waiting for someone to start doing it, and as soon as I set up like a group wanting to organise this and set up a mailing list of people who knew people. Um, it was hundreds in, in like the space of weeks who all came and said, yes, let's, let's definitely do this. Um, and there, there was very, there, there was very little in the way of pushback other than people who were just a little bit skeptical about, um, what it was, but skeptical in the sense of like, they didn't truly understand, uh, and wanted to know more, but.
Um, so the next question I had is, what was the process like and what were the key moments for you that you think are helpful to share with others who are venturing down a similar path? Uh, so the process for us was, uh, number one was getting uh, a collection of people together who were all like-minded in this goal of wanting to unionize. Uh, and then number two, it was a case of becoming connected in the labor movement around the UK for me. Um, so this was, I was helped massively at the very beginning by um, a lady who was in the French Game Workers Union um, who basically just sent me sent loads and loads of emails to people who were like union reps uh, and people around the country um, who were like, officials in the labor movement uh, just CC'd me in all of the emails and was like, hey, you, should, you should meet, you should meet Deck. He's, he's representing uh, game workers and they, they want to talk to you about what to do. And that was a really interesting process because many, I, I met with a lot of like union representatives who weren't particularly, um, how do I put this? The, 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 it did, the, the, game, the idea of like unionizing game developers wasn't really on their agenda, but it was still really, really useful to speak to them because there are many people who saw the prospect of a game developers union and were like, oh, we better talk to them first and see what their goals are and uh, see how we can help them. Um, there's a lot of solidarity in the labor mo movement, which you assume, which I'm glad about. Um, and beyond that, it was just talking to actual union representatives and being like, hey, what, what, what do I do? <laughs> mm -hmm. And as well as that, it was doing actual organized meetings with the people I was trying to get into, like get connected. And that is how uh, we gathered the first organizers who weren't me, uh, who really wanted to start doing it. And then they started taking some of the slack off of my hands uh, very quickly. Uh, but yeah, key, key moments, I guess, for me were just like meeting prospective uh, union representatives who would be able to help this group of people I have get unionized and deciding on the path i guess the key moment we had was i had was just when we when i met with the people who would go on to become the executive committee and we decided on what our course of action was um and our course of action was to go with the iwgb uh but that was an, that that was a democratic decision and even after that uh it would we decided we were going to put it to a uh, a vote of the entire membership um yeah uh i don't i don't know what i would say is helpful to share to others when venturing the similar path uh, I, I guess it's just don't be afraid about who you're emailing in the labor movement because everybody everybody wants to just get more people unionized no matter where they are hmm. um and don't take up too much work on your own. <laughs> it's a, yeah. um, like getting people involved as early as possible and yeah. uh, letting, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say the main thing is just like, there will be a core group of people who want to do the organizing. Um, and it's better to just have those people like take up volunteering positions and do what you can rather than try to get every single person interested organized mm. at once if that makes sense i was gonna say like just talking to people um different reps from different unions i've been absolutely amazed by the level of generosity and kindness in people wanting to support and help and that acknowledging that acknowledgement that you're not alone in this i think was really important Have there been any campaigns that you've run that have made an impact and or offered significant learning? The thing about escalation is a huge one. Um, 
like the idea that like uh, and and in like rep work I've done as well that the strategy that I've learned is like the best when it comes to uh, representing someone as a union and doing a campaign against an employer is you should always come to it from the perspective of you should always seem the most reasonable, which means you should never do the worst case. Well, you should, you should never bring out your big guns without asking them to come to the negotiation table first. Uh, and that's true in you know, large and small uh, situations. I mean, we're at the process now where we're trying to identify what the areas we would like to campaign on and um, like mm. making that a democratic process. But I mean, maybe that would be an interesting question to follow up from this is the strategies around the, you know, the creation of campaigns. How did you, what did you do to decide, okay, this is, this is what we're going to focus on now and this is how we're going to do it. What was that? What did that look like? Yeah. Uh, we still, I think we are still at, in our branch. We are still not at the point where we, we have the liberty of doing that. Um, we are still at the point where we're doing like mostly base organizing where, which means we are identifying employers who potentially have issues and trying to link up employees at, said, at those workplaces to get them organizing themselves. Um, and we we're really getting there, but at the moment, but the mo but most of the real campaigns that have uh, we've done in terms of just public outreach have really just been a reactionary to scandals because of that. That's how volatile our industry really is. Really, uh, most of our com like yeah, most of our comms and like most of the work we have done like like since starting or all of it or pretty much has been something really bad has happened in the games industry. It's usually to do with sexual harassment. Uh, and we have to then, we, we have basically comms plans uh, then offer support for workers mm -hmm. and let workers know that in situations like this, when uh, stuff like this is happening, uh, we are here. And yeah. <laughs> That 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 is the main thing. Is like, yeah, we we haven't really been able to choose. Um, and a, yeah, a, a big a bit of advice I would give to anyone is, you often won't be able to choose. You will often be in this situation where the nature of your industry will kind of dictate what campaigns you should be doing. I think when we first started talking one of the similarities we talked about was that that self-worth and, and actually with every union rep I've spoken to um, when I talk about you know valuing the work that we do and the level of kind of shame that we have um, in terms of asking to get paid and that level of kind of expectation to offer things for free because you know it's something you care about it's something you enjoy doing so why do you need to get paid for it that's like kind of a massive issue that we kind of face that's very inherent in, in our mm. industry and you said that that kind of resonated a lot with the gamers industry so it'd be really interesting to hear how that kind of shows up for you guys and um if that how and if that's been addressed through the union and what that might look like um yeah so oh god i, I get yeah I, I guess it's uh we, we always just refer to it as imposter syndrome all the time it's just um it, it's a really prevalent thing because it's, it's really hard to break into the gaming uh, gaming industry um uh, aside from like the absolute worst jobs that not aren't great in the first place, um, but a, a, a problem that that presents is um, there's a huge disparity in pay for similar roles all across the industry because people who are starting out and even people who have been in the industry for quite a while um, they. I, I feel it it presents this attitude where people uh, think that it's okay for them to accept less money simply because of the industry they are in. Um, and yeah, one of one of the ways the union tries to help with this is by um, encouraging talk of salary. And uh, there's a there's an industry body or a group of uh, 
people in the industry who were who big, made a big public spreadsheet of what their role was, how many years they had experience, and what their salary was. Uh, they, they also put it like where they lived as well, which put stuff into context. Um, but stuff like that is super duper useful because it means that we can say, well, on, on average, according to this, you should make. It's, it's usually something stupid like you should make somewhere between fifty thousand and twenty one thousand. It's like uh, it's uh, such a wide disparity. Um, but it's it's in the community of the union and like that's a huge factor of union work that people don't really appreciate um we try to like always point to point out to our members like you you, you are far more you're worth far more than you say well a lot of them know they're worth well, plenty but like you're, you're worth uh a lot more than you might think you are uh and we use this as a an example especially with like freelancers and stuff we de we've done a lot of research where we basically just say to freelancers like hey if you're a freelancer doing this this is how much you should expect for this much work if you've had this much experience um yeah uh i guess yeah that's, those are the changes but the changes are just uh things we have done <laughs> Do you know what i mean mm. um but yeah, I, I guess the main thing is the worst way it shows up is p p people like not accepting, uh, well, not demanding the pay they should be demanding. Uh, yeah, transparency came up as a key thing for us. Um, and as we're kind of delving into a bit more about how much people get paid, it's completely erratic and utter chaos. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, we have issues where lots of new teachers come in and are expected to teach for free or get paid less and then you know more experienced teachers will just be let go of quietly um in favor mm -hmm. of teachers that have just just joined and um and yeah it seems to be a, a, re a really big issue it's been one of the kind of the most challenging things to to read actually and to see is that kind of level of insecurity and and that lack of value that mm -hmm. you can just be replaced like that by someone um and the lack yeah. of accountability for that I, I yeah i guess sorry i guess that is another thing that it, way it manifests is like people always are very fearful of that they could be replaced very easily and that makes them wanting to unionize or very or the very least like organize with the union uh it makes it difficult for them because they fear reprisal um and we will always say if they do any reprisal and we can if you even even have like an inkling of proof that they're doing it we will like go we'll go straight for and we'll just like <laughs> The, the IWGB will not hesitate to take that to tribunal because mm. it's pretty easy to win a tribunal for those things. Okay, that's really interesting. And yeah, and people can join anonymously as well, can't they? They, they don't have to tell like their pace of work that they are. Oh, no, no. And all those things. It's good to have that clearly stated. Yeah. <laughs>
I'd say there's way more uh, implicit things we've done to help people than the explicit. Uh, but if you want, if you want justification of your value for money, the 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 constant legal insurance for a tenner a month, uh, the, the most lawyers aren't that aren't that cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when we did when we did our first survey like community was what people were calling out for more than anything um mm. like that acknowledgement of how isolated people can feel um particularly now i think lots of people yeah. are out in the dark not knowing what to do and yeah that sense of just being able to kind of connect with a, a body that has their interests at heart yeah um, which is lacking unfortunately <laughs> hmm. it's one of the reasons we let people join our like online chats and stuff and attend some of our meetings without having to be a member first hand because it's getting dues from people isn't the point we would rather just help anyone we can uh and yeah we, it, we've we've gained quite a lot of members actually by doing that anyway like, yeah. because people would come to us with an issue and like we have no reason not to answer them and give them advice where we, in, in any case in any way we can yeah, I, I found that really helpful. The IWGB, when I first started these um, this exploration, um, they said, come along and just like listen in on some of the meetings that we had. Mm. And I've shared this quite widely, but I think the most powerful thing for me was um, hearing all these different people talking from all different industries, um, feeling the familiarity of that and the kind of acknowledgement that we're all going through the same thing. And this sense of collectiveness that was so much bigger than myself so much bigger than yoga and beyond that it, it was really really powerful and um, um yeah just felt this kind of yeah form of camaraderie and solidarity that i hadn't experienced in a really really long time and i think that's really special and you have to go to those meetings i think to really get a sense of that more question <laughs> yep, yep. and I think we've kind of answered this already but I'll just ask anyway uh, what would you say to someone who feels skeptical or nervous in joining a union uh, I would say yeah I would say come and attend one of our meetings or come and chat to us um, uh, online or in person because I can uh, I, yeah I, I would say we're all a bunch of very nice people, but I, I imagine if you are skeptical or nervous, you have a reason. And I would like you to ask me directly what your fear fear is. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I am almost certain I can alleviate it. Okay. But yeah, it would have, you'd have to come to me with a very spe with a specific fear. Okay. And <laughs> just to follow up from that, what are what are the main fears that people often experience? Uh, the main thing I found is, yeah, um, reprisal from employer, I guess, is the main fear people have, um, which I always say, like, well, you, you, that could be a complete secret. Um, and if you do have reprisal from your employer, it will not be hard for us to um, defend you and mm -hmm. Make sure that your employer cannot touch you. Uh, in fact, the IWGB would be happy to. They revel at the yeah. prospect. I remember when I met Jason, the, the general secretary, for the first time. He, uh, <laughs> he he seemed genuinely excited when I said this was a, this was a common fear. And he was like, well, he kind of like <laughs> he basically, he basically like immediately turned around like zero. Has, um, hesitation and was just like, well, they can dry. They can dry. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was one of the main things that convinced me to go to the IWGB, if I'm honest. Re reassuring to have that level of confidence. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right, Declan, thank you so much. Um, no and just like a kind of like personal thank you as well, because uh, I think you were one of the first people I spoke to. Um, mm. And that was that conversation, I think, made it feel possible. Um, and to think how far we've come since those conversations is just really phenomenal.